Goodwin checked the radiation levels coming out of the chimney. They were high. High enough for him to believe a rogue uranium cartridge was the cause of the problem. In my opinion, uh, we'd got a, a badly burst uh, cartridge, fuel element, uranium fuel element. As serious as a burst cartridge was, the team had faced that situation before. The problem was, it wasn't a burst cartridge. It was a fire inside channel 2053. The cartridges, which had been redesigned to increase tritium output, had caught fire. The decision the year before to reduce the aluminium in the cartridges meant they could burn more easily. The extra heating for the Vigna release had caused them to burst and catch fire. The accident the scientists had feared had finally happened. But the men at Windscale didn't know that. They still thought it was just a burst cartridge that needed removing. They decided to cool down the graphite core and turned on the fans to blow it cold. It was a fateful decision. It's like putting a match to a piece of paper. The fire will spread along the material. In trying to cool the core, they had fanned the flames of the fire, causing it to spread throughout hundreds of channels. The fire was soon burning out of control. Radioactivity pouring out of the chimney. The activity in the chimney went up a lot. And it became obvious that something was really adrift. Outside, arriving for work, Eddie Davis could already see signs of the fire. I was walking down the road towards the pile and looked up at the chimney um, because we were responsible for the filters on the chimney and saw this smoke coming out of the chimney. In the control room, all eyes were on the temperature gauges. I came down and went into the control room again. And by then, quite a lot of people had gathered in there. One of my colleagues came across just reading out graphite temperatures which were going up. So, you know, this was clearly um, dreadful. The men knew this couldn't be a burst cartridge. It could only mean the reactor was on fire. So then I walked up onto the top of the pile and uh, I saw a monitor up there. And he said, don't go in the precipitator house because it's too hot. There's too much radiation there. There was no emergency plan for dealing with a fire. The men were on their own. He just said there'd been an incident. And I said, incident? He said, yes, I can't talk about it, love. I, I won't be coming home. Uh, I'll let you know as time goes on. Everybody was very subdued. And of course, nobody knew what was going to happen or how to treat it. The longer they did nothing, the more the fire would burn, and the more the radioactivity would pour out onto sea scale. If we carried on as we were, um, th there was the risk that the whole lot would burn and go up the chimney. No official warning was given. People in sea scale went about as normal. John was my baby and he was in a pram on the front lawn in the sunshine. And he, he rang up and said, get John in. And I said, why? Well, I said, just get him inside. Close all the windows, close all the doors. Don't go out and lock the hens up. I won't be home tonight. And that was it. One man had been missing from the emergency at Windscale, Tom Tui. I was at home when this happened. And I got a phone call from the general manager uh, and we had a very brief conversation. He said, Tom, pile one's on fire. I said, good God, you don't mean the call? He said, yes, can you come in? I said, yes. I got in my car and went straight to the pile.
I could climb up 80 feet into the air, no lift, with a respirator on my face and a bottle of air on my back to look down holes at the back of the reactor. There were four inspection holes at the back and um, you could look down those and see what was happening. Well, I looked down onto a blazing inferno. And it went through my mind that if the temperature exceeded 600 degrees centigrade, the floor on which I was standing could collapse. I thought, what a bloody mess we're in. I mean, literally, that's the, that's the thought that went through my mind. Word started to get out in sea scale. I, I do believe that Calder Girls School closed because of the, um, not immediately, because of the um, parents' worries about their children, of course. And I think some parents did come and take their children away immediately. Next thing was my daughter came flying in. Mummy, mummy, what's happening? I said, I don't know, Pet. What are you, why are you here? She said, well, we've all been sent home. She said, where's Daddy? I said, is it work? He said, is, she, is he coming home? I said, he won't be coming home today. Why? I said, I don't know, Pet. Half the village vanished. Uh, a lot of the, the, the fathers of, of children and the husbands of, of wives must have been able to get through or something, but they immediately said, get out, get out, go to, go to your mothers, go to your aunties, go, go, just go. And, and within overnight, there was only half of us here. I wasn't going to move as long as, long as my husband was there, I was going to stop here. This was a blazing inferno, and we knew it was pushing radioactive fission product waste up the chimney all the time, and uh, we, we didn't know what we could do to stop it in the first place. The decision was taken, I, I'm sure it was the right thing to do, um, to try to get shot of as much fuel from the core as possible. The men began an operation to try to remove the burning cartridges from the core. We were trying to, to push the burning fuel through uh, into the back of the reactor. But the heat had melted the cartridges, so they'd become stuck inside the core. They were forced to use scaffolding poles they'd found nearby to try and push the cartridges out. Radiation was so intense they could only work a few hours. They were running out of firefighters. The police uh, from the factory had turned up looking for volunteers. Uh, and they'd brought a bus and they decided the best way to get the volunteers was to go to the cinema and, uh, and volunteer the back two rows uh, at, the, uh, at the show to go into the factory to uh, as it turned out, to uh, help push the fuel rods out of the, uh, out of the reactor. Still on top of the reactor, one man ignored the radiation warnings. I decided that I didn't want somebody tapping me on the back and say, hey, you know, had too much. I knew I had to be there until the damn thing was dealt with. With no sign of the fire dying out, Tui began to think the unthinkable. It was I eventually who phoned the general manager's office and said, look, uh, I want to use water. If they tried to put the fire out with water, the consequences could be catastrophic. You didn't have to know the details about some steam coming out of some place or other to realize the potentiality for disaster. And it's a control bomb, really a nuclear power, a sort of control bomb. 